Okay, I need to start today's message with a warning. Okay, we're going to be kind of tiptoeing through a bit of a minefield today. I won't tell you why quite yet, but you'll discover it as we get going here a little bit. I just want to give you a heads up. This may not be my most popular message I've ever preached. You may be squirming in your seat a little bit. That's okay. We'll squirm together. It'll be a lot of fun. As we are on the road again, that's the series that we're in right now, week two of this series, as we're traveling with the Apostle Paul on his third missionary journey, his third of three missionary journeys. So we left off last week where Paul is in Ephesus, this ancient Roman city, the second or third largest uh, city in ancient Rome in the first century. And Ephesus is the city where Paul spends the most time of any place he ever travels on his journeys. He spends three years here in Ephesus, day after day, just teaching and building what will become probably the largest, strongest church in the first and second century. Uh, More than likely, scholars believe that a lot of the other churches that we read about, um, especially in Revelation that John talks about, that Jesus talks to, were planted from Ephesus. It was the, the mother church that planted these other churches and many more. So Paul's here for three years ministering. And last week, as we left off, Paul's time had sort of started coming to an end. He thought, I'm going to travel to a couple other places. And then his long-term plan was to get to Rome. He said, I've got to get to Rome. That was his new life's goal and life's passion. He will get there, but not maybe in the way that he thought he would, but that's going to be for another series later on down the road. So before Paul can leave Ephesus, though, of course, trouble has to ensue. Paul can't just enter and leave a city without something terrible happening, and Ephesus is certainly no exception to that rule. So we're going to start out by reading the second half of Acts chapter 19. We're going to read it's a little bit longer than we normally read. We're just going to read the whole story, the whole narrative out all at once, and then pull from it our main ideas today. So we're going to start out with a little bit longer, but it's a great story here that we're going to read. Acts 19, if you're following along, it's we're going to start at verse number 23. Acts 19, 23. And here's what Luke writes. About that time, so Paul says, I'm going to leave. About that time, serious trouble developed in Ephesus concerning the way. That's what Christians were called in the first century. It began with Demetrius, a silversmith who had a large business manufacturing silver shrines of the Greek goddess Artemis. He kept many craftsmen busy. He called them together along with others employed in similar trades and addressed them as follows. Here's what he says. Gentlemen, you know that our wealth comes from this business. But as you've seen and heard, this man Paul has persuaded many people that handmade gods aren't really gods at all. And he's done this not only here in Ephesus, but throughout the entire province. Of course, I'm not just talking about the loss of public respect for our business. I'm also concerned that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will lose its influence and that Artemis, this magnificent goddess worshipped throughout the province of Asia and all around the world, will be robbed of her great prestige. At this, their anger boiled and they began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Soon the whole city was filled with confusion. Everyone rushed to the amphitheater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, who were Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. Paul wanted to go in too, but the believers wouldn't let him. Some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, also sent a message to him, begging him not to risk his life by entering the amphitheater. Inside, the people were all shouting, some one thing and some another. Everything was in confusion. In fact, most of them didn't even know why they were there. The Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander forward and told him to explain the situation. He motioned for silence and tried to speak, but when the crowd realized he was a Jew, they started shouting again and kept it up for about two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. At last, the mayor was able to quiet them down enough to speak. Citizens of Ephesus, he said, everyone knows that Ephesus is the official guardian of the temple of the great Artemis, whose image fell down to us from heaven. Since this is an undeniable fact, you should stay calm and not do anything rash. You have brought these men here, but they have stolen nothing from the temple, and they have not spoken against our goddess. If Demetrius and the craftsmen have a case against them, the courts are in session, and the officials can hear the case at once. Make them... Let them make formal charges, and if there are complaints about other matters, they can be settled in a legal assembly. I'm afraid we're in danger of being charged with rioting by the Roman government since there is no cause for all this commotion. And if Rome demands an explanation, we won't know what to say. Then he dismissed them, and they dispersed. Again, a long passage there. We're going to jump off there. I want to show you a few pictures um, to kind of give you an idea, again, of the setting. We looked at a few last week. This is what remains of this great temple of Artemis. 
in 2024. It doesn't look like much, does it? Not a whole lot there that people would get into a panic and start a riot over. However, the second picture is a model of what it originally would have looked like. This is actually in Istanbul. Um, it's, it's a model, about 1 25th of the original size of the Temple of Artemis. And we know the dimensions and the size because a first century historian named Pliny the Elder, who basically wrote one of the first encyclopedias in the Western world, mentions specific details about uh, this temple. So just to give you an idea of the scope and size, uh, the Temple of Artemis in Ephesus was 425 feet long. 225 feet wide. Around the exterior there are 127 columns that are 60 feet high and four feet around. So a pretty large temple in this large city of Ephesus. Originally, this temple was constructed in the 6th century BC, but by the time Paul's here in the 1st century, it's been destroyed and rebuilt twice. And if you maybe you knew this or not, this was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. This temple of Artemis in Ephesus is one of the seven ancient uh, wonders of the ancient world. Now, so that's the temple. Let's look at the goddess for a second. This this is a couple pictures of the goddess Artemis. Now, these idols and artifacts actually date back to the first or second century. And so these might have, Demetrius may have made this. We don't know for sure, but they date back that far. So this is Artemis. She had a lot of things that people would pray to her for and worship her for. One of them was for fertility. She's a fertility goddess. You'll also see other paintings of her in ancient times with a bow and arrow. Uh, so she's also the goddess of the hunt. And Ephesus, as we mentioned last week, was known for their spiritism. They're known for their spirituality and their, their cult uh, worship of all these goddesses. Exclusively, Artemis is the big one with the temple. But we saw even last week with the demon-possessed person. This was everywhere in this ancient city of Ephesus. But one of the main, one of the main goddesses was certainly Artemis. She was so worshipped that, in fact, they had an entire month set aside every year to worship Artemis, where they would have feasts and festivals and parties for a month long. They also had what were called the Ionian Games, similar to the Olympics, in honor of Artemis here. And so it's possible, we don't know for sure, it doesn't have a date stamped on this event, but it would be safe to assume that this could have happened during that month of celebration. You would have had more people there to cause a riot like this. Uh, it would have, the, the worship of her would have been amplified and heightened above what would be normal. And so it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a stretch to think that this would have been during that, that time of the year, during that month of worship to Artemis. And so we, you might look at a culture like that or think about ancient cultures with all these gods and goddesses and think, well, isn't that silly? Isn't that sad that they would worship these idols and they would bow down to these images? And that's just primitive. And I'm really glad that we don't do that anymore. But we do that all the time. So today we're going to talk about idols, idols, idols. Now you know what I call this a minefield that we're going to tiptoe through. I'm going to try not to explode myself this morning before we leave the room, okay? So this is a tricky subject because idols are very sneaky. We don't probably, if you do, this is an easy one, an easy home run. Uh, if you have an idol or a shrine or an image that you actually do bow down to or pray to or worship, that's an easy, obvious one to just get rid of that right away. However, 99.999% of our idols are not those obvious things, yet they're just as real and just as deadly to our spiritual life. So we may not physically bow down to carved figures of stone or wood, but we're all tempted to worship idols that get in the way of true worship of the true God. So what I want to do with our time today is three things. I want to look at what idols are, what idols do, and then in response, what we do. Three, that's where we're going to go today. What idols are what idols do, and what we do. We'll spend most of our time on that first point, so if it seems like I'm on this one for a while, just breathe. The second two will be, not be as long, all right? Let's look first. Let's, let's make some definitional statements here. What are idols? What idols are is they are this. First, idols are the misuse of your attention and affection. Simply put, idols are the misuse of your attention and affection. It's designed to go toward God, but we somehow uh, misuse that, misappropriate that, and give attention and affection to those other things that become idols. Uh, Pastor Tim Keller, he, in a, a sermon years ago, he gave this definition, I think is a great textbook definition of idolatry. He says this, if there's anything more than God that is functionally more important to your happiness, your identity, your hope, and your meaning, that is functionally your God. 
That's a great textbook definition of what an idol is, what a false god is. Now, I want to use that, and I want to give this working definition that we'll kind of use for the rest of our time today. The de- a definition I want to use for idols are an idol is when a good thing becomes a god thing. Simply put, an idol is when a good thing becomes a god thing. So the things that we make into idols and false gods are themselves not bad. And we'll look at examples of that this morning. The things that we put into a place of preeminence are fine if they're in the proper place. If we see them correctly as God designed us to, most of the things that we make idols are actually useful things. They're tools that help us live life. However, if they take too much of our attention and affection, we elevate them to a place where only God should be, and that's when it becomes a problem. That's when it becomes an idol. So let let me just give this reality of, of this point. Anything can be made into an idol, and anyone can create an idol. Both of those statements are true. Anything can be made into an idol, and anyone can make or create an idol out of anything. Let me give you a simple example from the Bible. A a piece of fruit can become an idol, can it not? That's from the very beginning of the Bible, Genesis 3. Man and woman are made, Adam and Eve are made, they're in paradise, walking and talking with God. They have everything they need, they have no lack, and yet they're told, if you take this one thing that God says you can't have and shouldn't have, then you'll be like God. So they're told this lie that the one thing that you think you don't have or you, you think you have everything you need, but really you don't. You're missing out on something. And if you take this thing that God said to stay away from, then you'll be like him. Because really the problem is that God doesn't want you to have this thing. For some reason, he's maybe jealous that if you take this and eat this fruit, you'll be like him. He, he doesn't want that, and you, and, but you do want that. And so here's a classic story of what happens after they're told this lie. Genesis 3, verse 6, the woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious. She wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. The, they had everything they could ever want and need, but they still wanted more. That sounds ridiculous when you say it out loud like that, but that's what an idol is. I have everything I need in one source, but I'm looking to other sources to fill those needs that only God can fill. And the result for them was an idol was created. Again, the things that we turn into idols are not bad on their own. We just elevate them to a too high of a point. Can I give you a really practical, personal example how this would affect even someone like me? So ministry can become an idol for those in ministry. Okay, and ministry is good. It's great. Like it's one of the best things ever that you can spend your life doing. I believe that I'm called to do that. However, there's that there's that part of everyone's heart where it can become too important. I can look for validation in ministry instead of in God. And that leads down a very dark path. I can look for success as a certain thing that I'm trying to attain instead of just doing what God's called me to do. And then it becomes, this good thing becomes a God thing. It becomes an idol even in my own heart. So anything can become an idol and anyone can create an idol. And God talks about idolatry a lot, especially in the Old Testament, because they actually build physical, literal objects that they bow down and and worship. And so he talks about it a lot because he knows the human heart is broken in, by sin and is inclined to follow idols. So it's not like God's telling us something we don't know. He's reminding us of things that we choose to ignore. That's why it's in there so often. Let me give you an example. So the Ten Commandments, right? You think, well, the first two are definitely about idols, So the first commandment is have no other gods before God. Oh, that's okay. That's an easy, obvious one. Then the second one's even more obvious. The second commandment is don't make any graven images. Don't make any idols. It's like even in the wording of that commandment, it's very clear. So the first two of the ten, you say, well, 20% of the commandments talk about idolatry. That's pretty good. But I would submit that all ten of the top ten commandments warn against idolatry of our heart. So let me, let me, let's look through them just for a second, and I want to show you um, how that's the case. So the third commandment, don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Don't misuse God's name. We even sang a version of that name in our opening song this morning, Yahweh. So to the ancient Hebrews, the name of God is spelled Y-H-W-H. 
but the ancient Jews would not write that name down and they would not speak those letters in that way. It is too sacred because you can't actually really say it correctly. And so they had such reverence and fear for the name of God, they wouldn't even speak his name as he says it. So they have other names. That's where we get Jehovah from or Lord comes from Adonai. They have different versions that they know what they're trying to say, but they're not dare going to try to say the name. That's how revered God's name was to his people. And so when God makes this command, it's not just don't say that curse word, although I think that's implied. But to them, it meant don't don't dishonor God's name by dishonoring God because he held his Basically, the way God saw his name was it's, it's equal to him in holiness. It, his name is him. He represents his name. And so when he says that, he's saying, don't misuse my name because that would become idolatry. You're placing yourself in more important terms than the unspeakable name of God. That's a little bit strange, but that, I think that follows there. How about the fourth commandment? Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. So What happens is when we refuse to abide by the rhythms of life that God intends for us to live, we make ourselves, my time is an idol because I I just can't slow down. I can't do it. Well, you can, but we, we choose not to. And there are seasons and times where you're more busy than others and that happens. And there are times at work where you are burning, you know, the candle at both ends and you're working a lot of extra hours. But there are those times, however, that we choose to just be busy. Because our culture pressures us into thinking that that, that's how it should be. If you're not always running and doing something all the time, nonstop, then you're lazy, you're not productive, then what are you doing with your life? You're wasting your life. But that's not how God designed it. He's like, you get six days to run yourself ragged, then you got that seventh day. Once every seven days should be that time and that rhythm. Now, again, it's more than just take a break from work and come to church on Sunday. But even Jesus talks about those rhythms are important. And so when we intentionally, repeatedly, voluntarily don't live according to God's rhythm, we've made my my time is now an idol. My priorities are more important than God's design. So that's that's a big one there that we may not think about. I'm going to skip through these last ones really quickly, but they still all follow. All the commandments, all the big, the top ten, talk about idolatry. Honor your father and mother. When we, when we choose to show dishonor, I'm putting me above that person. I become the idol. I become the God. Now, it doesn't mean that if you have... If, if your parents have abandoned you or mistreated you, that you have to, you know, like be buddy-buddy with them. That's not honor, okay? There's a difference to that. But we honor that, and that's the only commandment that God gives with a promise as well, which so there's a bonus for doing that, right? But it's, it's about idolatry. How about this? Don't murder. That's an easy one, right? I'm valu- my life becomes an idol because it's more valuable than somebody else's. Easy one. An easy no-no. Adultery. Adultery means that that person that I'm pursuing that I should not be, they're the idol, God's design, and we'll look at this in more detail in a moment, God's designed that relationship to work in a certain way, and when I don't abide by that, that person I'm pursuing instead of God's command is now an idol. I've elevated them in too high of a place. Uh, Don't steal the Eighth Commandment. Obviously, their stuff is an idol that I want more than, you know, than I should. Don't bear false witness. That means that my reality, my truth, which is a common phrase right now, my truth is is an idol. It's more important than, you know, the, the truth. The last one, don't don't covet. So that means my unbridled desire has become an idol because I want something so bad, I want that person to not have it. I want them to lose that. So even if I don't get it, they don't have it. That's what that's the difference between really that's where coveting comes in there. It's this jealousy on steroids. Okay, so this is obviously a problem. God puts it in the fabric of all the major Ten Commandments here. And here's the crazy thing. Do you know how needed these commands are? They're so needed that while Moses is getting these commands on the mountain, what are the people doing at the foot of the mountain? They're building an idol. It's like God's like, I can't even get the words out of my mouth, and you're already breaking the law. Like, you people are the worst. They're literally building this golden calf because well, Moses has been gone for a while, and, you know, God hasn't shown up for a while, so let's build our own God who will lead us. And they build this golden calf. And so Moses comes down, and he's not happy, and he, you know, breaks the... Ten Commandments and has to get them rebuilt, you know. But, but it's, it's obviously a problem. So anything can become an idol, and anyone can create an idol. Um, 
And this, I'm, I'm going to quickly go through this. There's three main categories that idols tend to fall into as we try to define what they are in practical terms. Now, there are subcategories of this. I'm not going to e talk about every single idol that's out there, but I think there are three main categories that we can practically look at, and they're simply this, money, sex, and power. Those are the three main categories of idols. You can fit a lot of things into these three categories. Again, are these things bad? No. They're all gifts that God gives that are designed to work in a specific way for a specific purpose. The problem is when we elevate them to a place they should not be. Money is not bad, right? We misquote this verse all the time. That's why I want to read it. 1 Timothy 6.10, Paul writing here to Timothy says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, and some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Money's not the problem, we're the problem. My, my greed is the problem. My stinginess is the problem. My lack of responsibility is the problem. The object is never the idol. It's always within the human heart. That's the point here. Even with a tool like money, it's like any tool. If it's seen and used correctly, it has great benefit. If it's seen and used incorrectly, it has great destruction. Like a hammer. If I have a hammer and a bunch of nails and I use it to hammer the nails, I've been productive with that tool because I've used it correctly. However, if I bash in someone's skull with the hammer, that's not what it's designed for, and it causes destruction. It's no different with any of these things. Money is no exception to that. And so I think that's why this 90-day giving challenge that we're in is, is good. Because, again, it's not for or about the church. It's about is money an idol? Am I willing to see and use and handle money God's prescribed way, or am I making it too important? Am I trying to justify certain things in certain ways because it doesn't fit or it doesn't make sense? And can I tell you, like, we've, we've been there personally more than I can even begin to tell you, um, but God never fails. And that's the point. That's why God says, you don't need idols, you've got me. And so that, that's, that's one area where this works. Now, even the idea of... of of sex. It's not a bad thing, is it? It's a gift that God gives. However, it comes with instructions. It comes with parameters. And so what happens is we just use our own parameters. We just want our own way. It's like, no, no, you're misusing the gift, and so you're misappropriating your attention and affection to this thing, so now it's become an idol. And it's not just activity, sexual activity, that, and that can certainly be an issue, but even really, I think in our day and time, this idea of sexual identity and sexual expression has become the God of our time. It's become the God of our time. And so there's a, a great book that I would recommend um, if you need a doorstop, you know, you can buy it and use it for that, too. Uh, it's called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. It's by a guy named Carl Truman. And he's a person of faith, but he doesn't approach uh, this topic uh, in, that, in that lens. It's definitely, it's just a straight academic, secular, philosophical, cultural lens. But he has this idea throughout the book of expressive individualism. He said this idea of expressive individualism has gotten to this peak in our modern Western culture, and that's why we have all these sexually confused people in our culture. That's why you can be anything you want, and you can, you know, you can express yourself in any way you want. That's the crux of his argument here and why that's getting out of control. It's not a new problem. Sexual perversity is not a new thing. It's all over even the ancient scriptures. But it's gone in our culture from this fringe tolerance debate issue to now a mainstream celebration issue. And here's one thing that he says in his book here. He says this, the point I'm making is that we all live in a world in which it is increasingly easy to imagine that reality is something we can manipulate according to our own wills and desires and not something that we necessarily need to conform ourselves to or passively accept. Again, this issue is not a new thing, but it's getting worse and worse and worse. Here's how I would kind of paraphrase this idea is this, is we might worship idols as false gods, but in reality, when we worship idols, we become the false gods. And can I just tell you something? You make a really lousy God, and I make a really lousy God. So we'll talk more about, about, about that in just a moment. Let's look at this idea of power. So money, sex, and power. Here's how that might look in your life if this has become, you might say, well, what is that? I'm not, a I'm not in place of power. I don't have authority over a lot of people, but here's what that looks like. If your life has become consumed by your achievement, 
or your accolades or accumulation, maybe power has crept in a little bit too much into your heart. If you try to exert too much pressure, if you tend to manipulate people to get what you want, power maybe has become your God. If you try to guilt trip people into getting your way, right, uh, that can maybe mean that power has become too important. And this idea, even with power, is not just how we exert power, but how we um, express ourselves. So, like, social media online is a huge driver of this God. We try to curate this perfect life, right, to exert influence over people. We even have social media influencers, right? And so that's an issue that's kind of new, but we, we obsess sometimes over how many likes, how many clicks, who responded, who commented, was it a mean comment? Like, did this get shared 17 times? Oh, and if you, like, get something from that, then maybe, just maybe, this power thing has gotten too high on the throne of your heart. Maybe this social media thing, if it consumes hours and hours and hours of your day and you're just doom scrolling all the time, maybe we need to kind of put that aside and say, that's become too important. It's taking too much of my affection and attention. So maybe that's where this power struggle has come into. Again, these are good things that we make into God things. So these idols are just the misuse of our attention and affection. Let's go to the second one very quickly, and then we'll, we'll, we'll move along here pretty quickly. Um, if you're not already uncomfortable yet, you know, just hang on. We're, we're, you know, we're there. So that's what idols are. What, what do idols do? What idols do is they make you go crazy. Idols make you go crazy. And what happens is, first, there's kind of levels to this. First, we become defensive of our idols. That's the first reaction. Well, don't question me about that. That's my personal business. You don't know my situation. You can't talk to me about, about those things. You have no right, right? We, we get defensive immediately when someone like Indiana Jones tries to take the idol off the thing and replace it with God, who's that bag of sand. Like, we're like, no, 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 don't you dare touch that. You know, that's not yours to touch. We get defensive. And it's because we become obsessive about our idols. I need this thing. Even though God has prescriptions against it, he has commands against that, he's got a different way than this, I need that. I can't live without that thing. Again, go back to the definition at the beginning. If there's anything other than God that you say, I can't live without, then unless you're using hyperbole, sometimes we use that and don't, aren't thinking, we're not, we don't mean that, but sometimes we are serious. I cannot live without this item or this thing, right? And if we're, if we're there, we become obsessive about our idols. But then that leads to becoming possessive about our idols, and that's what makes us go crazy. That's what we see here in Acts 19. Let's read this argument one more time in the middle here. Um, Demetrius, he's exhibiting this, this thing. He's going crazy and leading this, uh, this city into an uproar. Let's look at this again. Acts 19, verse 23. About that time, serious trouble developed in Ephesus concerning the way. It began with Demetrius, a silversmith who had a large business manufacturing silver shrines of the Greek goddess Artemis. He kept many craftsmen busy. So that's a good thing, right? Business owner. It's good. He called them together along with others employed in similar trades and addressed them as follows. Here's his argument. Gentlemen, you know that our wealth comes from this business. But as you have seen and heard, this man Paul has persuaded many people that handmade gods aren't really gods at all. And he's done this not only here in Ephesus, but throughout the entire province. Of course, I'm not just talking about the loss of public respect for our business. He's deflecting here a little bit. I'm also concerned that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will lose its influence and that Artemis, this magnificent goddess worshipped throughout the province of Asia and all around the world, will be robbed of her great prestige. So he's defensive, he's obsessive, and he's possessive. He's saying, Paul's threatening my livelihood. How dare he? He's saying, Paul is threatening my workers. I'm employing tons of people, but Paul's trying to direct my business. Who does he think he is? He's becoming defensive, obsessive, and possessive about these idols. He says, our wealth, what does he say? Our wealth relies on these idols. We need these idols, or we're going to be poor and on the street and destitute. Without these idols, we not only lose our money, but then the great Artemis will lose respect and influence. And the reason he's saying that is also for a monetary financial reason, because in many of these large ancient cities, these larger temples are not just a place of worship. They also serve as a local bank in many ways. And so what you would have here is people would come to this temple to put investments into maybe his trade guild. 
they're going to come, they're going to, there are even uh, sections in parts of these temples where there is some sort of ancient safety deposit boxes. You can keep your valuables there. Uh, it, it is a driver of the local economy. And so he's saying, if you threaten our way of life and you threaten my business and my wealth, it's going down. And he literally starts a riot in the middle of the town. That's how crazy his idols made him. And notice, Paul is never violent or forceful. That's not his style. That's not his thing. We see nothing him of here, him here at all. He wants to go in to try to calm the crowd down. They're like, no, no, if you want to die today, you can do that. But we're not doing that. And, but the response to him was violent and forceful, and that's a giveaway. If that's the response that we have to these other things, there's a problem there. If we get too defensive, too possessive, too obsessive about these other things, and we feel like, ooh, you know, it's getting too close, hitting too close to home, then there might be a reason to, for concern in our heart. And that's what we see here. They kind of played, outplayed their, overplayed their hand here a little bit. But idols make you go crazy, and here's, here's why. It's because idols are liars. Idols are liars. They cause you to live life backwards, to believe lies, and to live a lie. So when we worship idols, we end up feeling empty and disappointed because they never deliver what they promise. Again, go back to Genesis 3. The, the serpent said, if you eat this fruit, you'll be like God. Whoa, who wouldn't want that? Guess what? Genesis chapter 1 already told us they were like God. He says, I'm going to make man in my own image. That's as good as it's going to get, a carbon copy, basically, of their creator. It's how they came into the world. And the, and the serpent says, you can have more than that. So they were convinced. They ate the apple. They wanted this wisdom. And what happened, though, Genesis 3, verse 7, at that moment, their eyes were opened. They suddenly felt shame, hmm, interesting, at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. The promise of the idol was wisdom and divinity. But the reality was nakedness, guilt, and shame. The first negative human emotions ever recorded because they made an idol. So not only are idols liars, but here's what's even worse and even more embarrassing, is that idols are lies that we tell ourselves and fool ourselves with. And this is what the Old Testament tells us. I'm going to read a couple of scriptures here, and then we'll move on to the last point. This morning, Psalm 135, 15 through 18, the psalmist says, The idols of the nations are merely things of silver and gold shaped by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak and eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear and mouths but cannot breathe. And those who make idols are just like them, as are all who trust in them. He's saying idols are big fat liars. And they're lies that you're convincing yourselves of. Like you're holding this thing in your hand. You, you know this has no power. You know it can't do anything, yet you would give your life for it. You're going to pray to it. You're going to sacrifice for it. How ridiculous is that? And then Isaiah, the prophet, says the same thing, kind of in the way that I just described. But I want to read anyway. He says it more poetic than I just said it, okay? Isaiah 44, starting at verse number 9. Isaiah says, How foolish are those who manufacture idols. These prized objects are really worthless. The people who worship idols don't know this, so they're all put to shame. Who but a fool would make his own God, an idol that cannot help him one bit? All who worship idols will be disgraced along with all these craftsmen, mere humans, who claim they can make a God. They may all stand together, but they will stand in terror and shame. Then skip down to Isaiah 44, verse 19. The person who made the idol never stops to reflect why, it's just a block of wood. I burned half of it for heat and use it to bake my bread and roast my meat. How can the rest of it be a god? Should I bow down to worship a piece of wood? The poor, deluded fool feeds on ashes. He trusts something that can't help him at all, yet he cannot bring himself to ask, is this idol that I'm holding in my hand a lie? The answer to that last question is, yes, it is. The idol that you hold in your hand or in your heart is a lie. It will not deliver what it promises. It will not bring you what you think it will. So these are lies that we fool ourselves with. It's like, you know, the, the emperor's new clothes, that story. The emperor of this city has these charlatans come in. They say, we have the finest new fabric. It's state of the art. It's, you know, we printed it on our 3D printer and you can wear it. And they, and they have him and there's like nothing there. It's, there's, it's air. So he puts on these fancy robes, and these people say, oh, you look great. You never look better, but he's completely naked. 
And then the advisors don't want to look like fools, and so they say, oh, yeah, you've never looked better. He could lose some weight. I mean, good grief, you know, but there's nothing on. He's naked, but they believe the obvious lie. Then he goes on a, can you believe this? He goes on a parade through town with his brand new clothes on that are nothing. And he goes to, and everybody in the town doesn't want to be a fool. So, oh, you've never looked better. You look, oh, I love that new fabric. You know, you, you've been working out, you know. And how do you, how could you tell? Because well, you're naked. But nobody will say it except for a little boy in the crowd who finally says, hey, the emperor is naked. And then, every, and then the jig is up. So can I just tell you in your life that ho- the Holy Spirit is like that little boy? He's telling you what you need to hear, even though you want to claim these are really nice clothes I got on when you're completely naked. This idol gives me what I need, but it it doesn't. It's a lie that we trick ourselves with. He's the Holy Spirit is speaking to you constantly, warning you, telling you this will not deliver what you think it will. It is a lie. It is lying to you. Do not turn to that thing. Do not give it your attention and affection. If you do, you'll go crazy. You'll waste your life. You'll ruin your life because that's what idols do. So let's close with this. The last thing, it'll just take another couple minutes here. So if we don't want that result, if I don't want to waste my life, ruin my life, and worship these empty, false, lying idols, what do we do? What we do is we crush the idols. We crush the idols. That's what we do. Let's read this. Psalm 24. This is a a psalm of King David. Psalm 24, verses 1 through 6. David writes, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the water. That's a good place to start there. You can have this empty, useless, stupid idol, or you can have the God that made everything. And then he says this, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false God. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God, their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. So if you and I want to ascend the hill of the Lord, we've got to remove the dead weight of idols. We're not going to make it. Otherwise, if you and I want to receive the blessing from the Lord, we've got to stop seeking blessings from idols. We can either seek the face of God or we can meet the fate of our idols. Those are the options that lay before us. We crush the idols. But there's a cost to crushing idols. It's not cheap. It's not free. There's a cost. Maybe it is financial. Maybe when you decide, okay, I'm going to see and use money the way that God wants me to see it and use it, you might have to wait a little longer to take that vacation. You might have to lower your standard of living because now I'm going to use money responsibly. I'm not just going to charge it, charge it, charge it. Like, I'm not just going to, like, you know, go over everything. I'm not going to blow it as soon as I get it. Like, I'm going to live the way with money that God wants me to. So it's going to change maybe the way that you live. There might be a cost to that. Even relationally, if you, if you, are not living by a biblical sexual ethic, and then you decide that's become an idol, I've got to change that, there might be relational problems there. There there might be a breakup on the horizon. There might be issues. You might get found out, a secret that you thought you could keep, but now you're going to break that off. Oh, boy, there might be a cost to that. And there's definitely an emotional cost to crushing idols. There is. There's, like, withdrawal symptoms. Where am I going to find value now? Where am I going to find my meaning now? Where am I going to find my purpose now? Those things are gone. I've crushed the idols now. It's like you find those where you should have found them all along, in God, in Jesus, your Savior. That's where we find them. So there is a cost and there's a reaction, as we saw in Acts 19. If you choose to crush idols, there will be people in your life that will not understand. Some of your neighbors might be a bit shocked, maybe even secondhand embarrassment. Ooh, you mean you had to sell your car because you're, you know, you, you changed the way you do your money? Ooh, boy. Maybe, like, you're going to have friends that you thought were close, but now that you're not on their level financially, a.k.a. in debt like they are, you know, uh, they don't want to be seen with you anymore because you don't, you know, have those fine clothes that you, like, you, you do, whoa, you, like you, you shop at, at secondhand stores now? Oh, my goodness. Like, how could you? And so there, there's going to be sometimes a reaction. People may judge you or oppose you. They may abandon you altogether because you're choosing to crush the idols in your life. And the reaction that we see here in Acts 19 is the same one that maybe you might have in your life. When you get serious about crushing idols, when I get serious about crushing idols, people are probably going to say, don't preach to me. Like you're you're telling them how you're changing your life. But they feel conviction but see it as judgment. And so like, don't you dare preach to me. I didn't say anything about you. I'm talking about what Jesus is doing in my life. 
I'm talking about the change that I'm making. I'm talking about I'm closer to God than ever, right? And they're like, oh, you're not better than me. How dare you? You know, and it's just like, no, that's what happened here in Acts 19. How dare you call that an idol in my life? I didn't. I'm talking, it was an idol for me. It is for you too, but I didn't, I'm not going going there. But that's how people sometimes react. If you crush your idols, the truth is, if you crush your idols, you might get crushed. And that's kind of the point. That's the point. Let me close with this last verse, Psalm 139, 23 and 24. It says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Again, we don't bow to physical idols and figures of wood or stone, but we are all capable. Anything can become an idol, and anyone can create an idol. So my prayer for us as we close is God help us to see that thing, that activity, that relationship, that situation that's become an idol, and crush it. God, I want you to be on the throne of my heart, you and you alone. God, I want to look to you and rely upon you only for all that I need in my life. God, I want you to be my primary pursuit. Our prayer hopefully should be, God, crush the idols. Crush me. Like, get me out of the way. That's what the call to follow Jesus is. Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, the first thing you do is die. He says, if anybody's going to follow me, you have to deny, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. So we have to crush these idols, and we're going to get crushed along the way, but it's the best kind of crushing. Like, it's the best crush you'll ever have. Like, more than the crush I have on my girlfriend named Kim, right? It's the best kind of crush. Is when I allow, like, and that's what the Psalm 139, God, I'm allowing you, like, come down like a hammer and crush all the idols in my heart because I want to ascend that hill with clean hands and a pure heart. So you can chase these empty idols that will lie to you and that will make you lie to yourself and be empty and unsatisfied, or you can love and serve a God who has limitless supply to provide your needs, who loves you unconditionally, who created you in his image, and who died. He sent his son to die for you and has the power to raise him from the dead. Those are the options. I can follow empty, worthless, stupid idols, or I can serve and worship the God of the universe. So the question is, what will we worship and who will we worship? Let's pray today. God, that is the question before us, is what will we worship? Who will we worship? What or who will we give our affection and attention? Will we choose to turn good things into God things? Or will we allow God to give us those good things? God, may we choose you over empty, lifeless, lying idols. May we choose you over an endless, fruitless pursuit. May we look to you to find the provision that we long for, the identity that we look for, the peace and security, the acceptance, the hope and the love that we all crave. We can find it in you. Help us to pursue you and you alone. God, we know the temptation that anything can become an idol, and any one of us can create those idols. No one is immune. Nothing is off limits. So keep us in check. Crush those idols in our life so we can be people of clean hands and pure hearts to ascend the hill of the Lord and have that relationship with you and you alone. I want to close just a little bit different today, so you can go ahead and look up really quick. i got one more slide. I'm gonna, that last verse, Psalm 139, we're going to read it together as a closing prayer. So if you, if you don't, you don't want to do this, if, you, if, you, if you're like, well, I don't want to crush idols, then don't pray it. Don't pray a lie, okay? But if you're like, okay, yeah, I, I want that. I need that. That's what I want. If you, I, you want God to crush the idols, we're going to pray this together as our closing prayer, and then we're out of here, okay? So let's pray this prayer together. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Amen. So let's go out this week, and let's crush some idols. What do you say? We'll see you next weekend. Love you guys.